Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pam Wycliffe, and I'm on a little committee that puts together our Lunch with the League every month. And uh, today we will be taking a bike ride, I think. Anyway, I, a few things that I want to say before we start, and that is uh, the League of Women Voters never support or oppose any political party or candidate. We are a nonpartisan political organization. And we encourage informed and active participation in government. We never support or oppose a party or a candidate. I just said that. But what we do do is uh, we do unbiased, nonpartisan information about elections, the voting process, and issues. And sometimes we do studies of issues and we use our positions after the study to advocate for or against particular policies that are of public interest. So because of that today, um, the opinions and comments you might hear from folks aren't necessarily those of the league, but those of, are of the individual. We'll be here from noon until one and the general format, and Aaron has agreed that he'll speak for about a half hour, and then we will have a Q&A after that. Um, please remain muted <laughs> throughout and put your comments or your questions in the chat down below, and then Aaron can read them afterwards, um, and we'll answer your questions through the chat. If you are interested in more information about the league, uh, you can go to lwvsouthbend.org and it will give you the link. Not only will it tell you what we're doing locally, but it'll also give you a link to the state and to the national uh, League of Women Voters. And you can find out what all about us and all the stuff that we uh, stand for and uh, and are advocating a little bit of news about the our about our league is um and I think uh, Jerry has put it in several times when she send out sent out things um but we would like to remind the league members to log into the league website that I just gave you and update your member interest survey uh, the league needs volunteers in a bunch of areas and there's a spot for you whether you have a little time or a lot of time to share. And you'll find instructions on how to do that. So we want you to plug into those areas that are of particular interest for you. And um, we can snatch you up and have you be active um, in the process. And we're gonna be starting more activity, you know, as we get closer and closer to elections. Also, could I just put in a plug? Right here and right now. Well, there you are. Borrowing yeah. from the U.S. Army, they're back to be all you can be. So join the League of Women Voters and you can be all you can be. There you go. Thank you very much, Beth. Okay, now, uh, and and also that those interest sheets that, uh, that Jerry would like you to fill in, um, are due by September the 1st. So you have a month to go in and figure out how to uh, how to figure out what your interests are and how the parts that you might be wanting to get involved. And so today our speaker is Aaron Hellman. He is an adventurer, a historian, a storyteller, and an author. And Aaron is passionate about honoring history by telling fascinating stories in fascinating ways. A nearly lifelong resident of Michiana, he is a proud graduate of La, uh, La Salle High School. He lives in Granger and is always excited for his next adventure on a bike, on a hike, or at the library. He's the author of two local history books. One is The Incomplete History of St. Joe County, Indiana, which is what we're probably going to hear about today, and Ride the Jackrabbit. And so he will now take us on his bike rides and what he has um, learned from his many bike rides in our county, in our Michiana, right? That's right. It's all yours. 
Aaron. All right. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I recognize a few of you. Will you wave at me if you've already read uh, this book, An Incomplete History of St. Joseph County, Indiana? All right, some of you, some of you. And uh, I know some of you have probably seen me speak uh, speak on it before at different events. Um, I'm not gonna try to say too many of the same things. I've got, I'm gonna share a little bit about how I became interested and fascinated with local history. And then I'm gonna share um, two or three fascinating stories um, as time allows. One is from an incomplete history of St. Joseph County, but two of them will be from my new book, Ride the Jackrabbit, and you will be the first group of people who gets to hear them, which is very exciting. Um, so a little bit of my story. Um, I am pretty much a lifelong resident of, of St. Joseph County. I Grew up on the northwest side near Riverside in Cleveland, went to uh, Coquillard, Kennedy, Dickinson, and graduated from LaSalle High School. I've worked in uh, a lot of nonprofits in the area up here. And during uh, the pandemic, I discovered a fascination with local history. And it, it, it kind of happened by accident. So um, you might remember, uh, you know, that pandemic. Um, I remember when the library kind of reopened and it wasn't like super open, like you could just go in and you couldn't sit anywhere, but you could look at books. And, and so I did that one day. Um, I was driving past the Francis Branch Library and I thought, I wonder what they have that's new. So I stopped in at the library and there was a book on the one of the front shelves called The Bone and the Sinew of the Land. And I had no idea what it was about, but I thought the title of the book was fascinating. So I said, I wonder what that book's about. I read the book. The book was about the um, trials and tribulations of African-American pioneers in the years before the Civil War, when they began to settle in the Wild West, when Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and Illinois were the Wild West. And there were these fascinating stories of African-American pioneers settling land in Indiana, Michigan, uh, Illinois, Kentucky. And I thought, I wonder if any of them settled around here. So I, I did a Google. And I did find that the, the Huggert family had settled um, south of town by Potato Creek, the corner of Mulberry and Four. So I said, I wonder if there's anything down there. And, you know, it was a pandemic. So I just hopped on my bike and rode down there. I read the historical marker. I rode around the old land. I came home and I said, I wonder if there's enough of these stories to make a book. And there were. So I rode um, in my first book, it's, it's 12 bike rides to every uh, town, township, corner of the county. The last chapter of the book, we rode 112 miles around the exterior of the county lines. Uh, we explored stories I'd never heard before. And uh, I know some of you have heard me talk quite a bit about the river, the portage, or the Grand Kankakee Marsh. Um, today, I'm going to share with you my three favorite um, offbeat stories. So you might be familiar with the Coquillards or the Navars or the Colfaxes, the, the real big names in the history of our county, the people with streets named after them in, in South Bend and Mishawaka. Um, I've got three more bonkers stories that um, you're going to go nuts for. If you've read the first book, you already know this first story, but it's about the founder of New Carlisle. Um, this was the story that I researched and said, oh yeah, no, I'm definitely writing a book, right? After I did the first bike ride, I thought, okay, there might be something here. Um, and then I went to New Carlisle, which is, um, fine place. It's not the most exciting town in the world if you've been there. And then when I realized what a gold mine, this small, relatively nondescript town was, I said, I'm going to write a whole book. So I'm going to tell you about, uh, Richard Carlisle who was the founder of New Carlisle. And uh, Richard Carlisle was from Philadelphia, born and raised in Philadelphia, loved Philadelphia. In 1835, at 21 years old, he somehow came into $2,000, which is a, a ton of money back then. We don't know how he got it. And he decided to buy some land on the burgeoning Western frontier. He bought the land that would become New Carlisle, immediately named the town after himself, began planning and mapping the roads, and then um, named the roads in the town after his favorite roads back home in Philadelphia. 
That's why if you go to New Carlisle, there is a race street, even though New Carlisle does not have a river, nor does it have a race. So he builds up this town, um, builds a log cabin, starts a post office, um, kind of gets the town moving just a little bit, gets it up off his feet. And then he, without warning, runs away to join the circus. Um, he joins the circus because he is a kind of a renowned sharpshooter with a gun and he is an incredible juggler. In fact, by 1841, he had adopted the nickname Professor Risley. He was the most famous juggler in the world, which doesn't sound like much now, but if you were a circus superstar in 1841, that was about as big as it got. He traveled all over the United States. He traveled uh, through Europe. He performed for Kings and Queens, his juggling act. He's in the Juggling Hall of Fame. The Guinness Book of World Records recognizes him as the inventor of something called the Risley Act, where he would lie on his back and juggle children with his feet. He became very famous and very wealthy doing this stuff. And then uh, he disappeared again. Disappeared again, started panning for gold in New Zealand, lived in Shanghai for a while doing no one knows exactly what. 1864, at the age of 50, Richard Risley Carlyle was living in Shanghai when Japan opened its borders to the West for the first time. And Richard Carlyle hopped on a boat, sailed over from Shanghai. It was just about the first American entrepreneur to set foot in Japan. And he introduced them to something they'd never had before, ice cream. He made a ton of money as the first ice cream exporter to Japan. Then he started a circus in Japan that toured the nation and took the nation by storm. He then brought that circus back to the United States. He called it his imperial troop, and he performed for presidents and dignitaries across the United States. When Richard Carlyle was on the tour in the train with his circus, he passed through New Carlyle once. Only one time after he left the town did he ever come through. It was just a whistle stop. Someone recognized him. He talked to him and said, I'll come back someday but he never did. When Richard Carlyle died, he was not buried in New Carlisle. He went back to Philadelphia, where he was buried in a, in a cemetery out there. Um, he's a fascinating guy to me because he's about the most entrepreneurial fellow I've ever seen in any book I've ever read about. He was all over the world. Uh, he couldn't read yet somehow he founded a town, became a superstar, launched several businesses, and uh, came out with one of the most fascinating stories in my first book. Now, if, if you've read the book, you've, you've already heard all that. So I'm glad you stuck with me because now we're gonna get into the stuff that I'm really, really, really excited about. Now, my new book, Ride the Jackrabbit, comes out on September 15th. So in just about a month, it's been a very exciting uh, summer for me. And uh, people asked me after I wrote my first book when the sequel was gonna come out. And um, I said, I don't know if I'm gonna write a sequel. Uh, sequels usually aren't as good as the original in movies. And I had covered so much ground in the first book that I didn't just want the second book to be like, here's all the stories that weren't quite good enough for the first book. Um, but as I talked to groups like this one and met people, and met a lot of people and people started emailing me and I started having like fans, which was weird. Um, people started giving me stories. Hey, Aaron, did you hear about this guy? Hey, Aaron, did you hear about the time that Babe Ruth hit a home run in South Bend? Or, hey, Aaron, did you hear about um, this, this town or the time that someone um, bombed the Palais Royale building in South Bend? Did you ever hear about that? And I said, whoa, there might be enough for another book. And that's what I wrote. Um, my new book dives into a lot of unsolved mysteries. It tells the stories of some of the most fascinating old timey journalists who um, some of the biggest journalists in the history of the United States got their start at the South Bend News Times, which was South Bend's 
second newspaper back in the day. I'm not going to tell you any more about any of those today. You'll have to buy the book for that. But instead, I am going to tell you about the Huckleberry Queen. Will you wave at me if you've ever heard of the Huckleberry Queen before? Hang on, I'm scrolling. No one's waving. All right. I love this story so much. I love this woman so much. It's a uh, it's the most bananas story in this new book and you're getting it for free. So south of Walkerton, there is a, an intersection called Tyner. I hesitate to call it a town or a village. It's an intersection called Tyner, Indiana. And there's, there's not much there. Um, but back in the day, Tyner, Indiana was maybe the most exciting place possibly in the entire United States for a few weeks every single summer. So I'm, I'm gonna read to you a little bit about what was going down in Tyner. The long expired marshlands of Northern Indiana birthed life and lives long forgotten. Stories of animals extincted, biomes evaporated and climates changed and erased. For a while, the muddy marshes of Tyner, Indiana were among the most legendary of these wetlands. Launching communities and economies churches and orgies, criminals and evangelists. Wild huckleberries grew almost without limit in the damp underbrush of Tyner's Great Huck Marsh, inviting a crowd of itinerant laborers to comb through a thousand acres of marshland to harvest the swampy crop. Tyner exploded during the summers when the huckleberries came into season. As many as five, thousand people spilled into the marsh to pick huckleberries, wallow in the mud, and drink to and beyond their fill. It was an eclectic collection of the furthest flung fringes of 1870s society. Circus acts, carnival workers, gamblers, irreligious rejects, gypsies, hobos, vagrants, pre-Marxist hooch enthusiasts, pickpockets, scam artists, pagans, hardened criminals, and low-grade thieves, backwoods musicians with accordions and cymbals, traveling magicians and dealers of potions, post-capitalistic utopian wannabes, fortune tellers, treasure hunters, revelers, rabble-rousers, refugees, runaways, prostitutes and their keepers, early progressive first wave hippies, post-racial harmonists, desperados, ritualists, dancers with tassels and baubles, disinterested degenerate distillers, anarchists, early overdosers, exploiters of cheap labor, ambitious voodoo entrepreneurs, conspiracy theorists, failed politicians, snake oil druggists, and of course, the veritable army of committed Protestant preachers bound and determined to save all of them from their sin. The huckleberry trade in Tyner was enormous. The Plymouth Democrat newspaper described it in 1870 by saying that they could ship out 200 bushels per day and prices were about three dollars a bushel. Adjusted for inflation, they were making about 15,000 a day in just huckleberries. For the unskilled and uneducated, their daily profits dwarfed what they might receive in traditional and Endeavors, but they didn't keep much of the money for themselves. Instead, they passed most of their profits along to drink pourers, card dealers, and women of the night. The Tyner Marsh didn't just make money selling huckleberries, an entire economy sprung up around it. The renown of the marsh spilled across the nation as its scandals were told in newspapers as far afield as Colorado, New York, Florida, Nebraska, and Washington State. Pickpockets, thieves, and strumpets mingle among the pickers, one newspaper wrote. Gambling, drinking, violence, and prostitution are carried on to a fearful extent. There are 500 fallen women there on Sundays. No exaggeration. Local police kind of ignored it. It was something that happened in a marsh. It wasn't their problem. And if you know anything about the area around Tyner, there was not a police force within 20 miles that could handle 5,000 of these people. So there were brawls and drunken fights with gouged eyes, ripped ears, indiscriminate shootings, and even a handful of deaths. Left to its own devices, the place might have destroyed itself. It was an anarchy, but it wasn't gonna be anarchy for long. It was about to become 
a monarchy. Somehow a woman named Mary Louisa came to arrive at the Great Huck Marsh. No one actually knows how she got there. There are all these fantastic legends about how the woman arrived. Some say she came down because a businessman put up a carousel near the marsh and she wanted to ride it. Others claim that she was a circus performer who worked under the alias, the woman with the iron jaw. Some said she was a prostitute out of Indianapolis who was willing to travel and compromise her working conditions for a little bit of extra pay. No one really knows who she was, how she got there. The only thing that they can really agree on is that she loved liquor and cigars. She had a rough and tumble life and that she was blonde and beautiful. The Marsh chose Mary Louisa as their queen. She was a sensation. Whether it was the dynamite force of her massive personality, her professional prowess, or some strange magic of the long expired marshlands, the people of the place flocked to the woman who would come to call the wetlands her home, and perhaps even her fiefdom. Newspaper wrote that when she went to the marsh, her strength, dash, and other abandon won her, by common consent, the title of the Huckleberry Queen, and no one disputes it. She reigns supreme over the marsh. Mary Louisa was judge, jury, executioner, and queen during her time. She made short work of men accused of rape, beating them senseless, and then dismissing them entirely. Legends told that the queen saved men from drowning, that she provided food for the hungry, and procured medicine for sick women. But she was far from angelic. She wielded her power in often wicked demonstrations, once whipping her own husband in sight of the masses just to show she would do it. She was a regular in local papers, and headline writers loved her. I'm just going to read my very favorite. Uh, if you know, there's a, there's a town called Bourbon, Indiana. So you need to know that there's a town called Bourbon, Indiana in order to get this headline. A Bourbonite was skilleted over the head by the Huckleberry Queen on Saturday. For the duration of her reign, the Marsh had law, even if it did not have order. Her rule was absolute. And when the debauchery spilled onto certain private lands, even the landowners did not question her authority. She arranged contracts with the upstanding landowners. In return for tolerating the revelers, the subjects of her kingdom, and turning a blind eye to their debauchery, she would guarantee that the landowners received profits from the crop harvested on their land. It wasn't a bad deal for them financially, and it was certainly better than being on the wrong end of the queen's ire. Not everyone was a fan of the queen though. The National Police Gazette ran an article about her in 1879 that called her a notorious harlot so bad that whenever a rattlesnake bites her, the rattlesnake dies. For eight weeks every summer, the Huckleberry Queen reigned supreme. Local papers said that the movement of the citizens of St. Joe Stark and Marshall County to secure law and order were stopped at every single attempt. They claimed that they'd be able to put an end to the marsh, but they couldn't. By the vigorous use of all lawful means, they shouted, we will, sure, we will assuredly rescue our fair name and our borders from deep dishonor and sickening contamination of this foul cesspool whose offense is rank and smells to heaven. In the end, they wouldn't have to. The story of the Huckleberry Marsh ends the same way that the story of most of Northern Indiana's best biomes ended. But this one, a little differently. Saddened by the sin she'd seen her son succumb to, there was an incensed mother from Walkerton who marched into the marsh at the season's end, doused the entire thing with kerosene, and burned it all down. During the next decade, efforts to drain Northern Indiana's marshlands would ensure that none of the Huckleberry Marsh would ever come back 
The land was recovered, restored, and replanted as celery fields. And if you're thinking that the coronation of a celery queen doesn't have quite the same ring to it, you're exactly right. The queen's reign over the Huckleberry Marsh was over and it wasn't coming back again. South Bend Tribune ran the Huckleberry Queen's obituary in 1902. St. Joseph County, the hitherto undisputed realm of that patron saint of morality, the Huckleberry Queen, has lost a distinction it has possessed for years and years. The Big Huckleberry Marsh, which occupied a great share of the county and was known throughout this and adjoining states and which has in past time produced immense crops of berries and criminals has been converted into a peaceful celery garden by its owner. We will all miss them. Old St. Joe County, the loss will be double. Sorry, where are we at for time? I think you've got 12, two minutes. 28. Two minutes? 12.28. 12, 12, 12, 12.28. Then I am just going to tease my last story. Um, anyone, wave, wave your hands at me if you've ever been to Bonneville Mills. Bonneville Mills County Park in Elkhart. Beautiful place, beautiful place. It's the most photographed place in all of Elkhart. Wave your hand at me if you know anything about the guy who founded Bonneville Mills. All right. Oh, we got a little we got a hand, Gordon and Phyllis. Okay. Everyone else, you're gonna, you're really gonna have to buy this book. Um, the founder of Bonneville Mills was a guy named Edward Bonney. He founded the town, left the town um, in a very similar way that Richard Carlyle left the town he built. Edward Bonney became a famous counterfeiter. And then he became the personal bodyguard to Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon religion. And then Edward Bonney was arrested. And then Edward Bonney became a bounty hunter. And then Edward Bonney wrote a book, and some people say he's the father of the entire genre of true crime. And that's my time. For everything else, you're gonna to wanna to get the book, Ride the Jackrabbit, more of the people, places, and events that make Michiana fascinating. Available for pre-order right now at aaronhellman.com. That's A-A-R-O-N-H-E-L-M-A-N.com. And now I am excited to take some questions. So I'm gonna peek into the chat. If you have more questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. I didn't know we came from such a an interesting part of the country. Um, I wrote when I um, when I put together the teaser for my new book, the, the first line says, no one told us that we live in the most fascinating part of the Midwest. And um, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I, I've traveled a lot. I, I look at whenever I go somewhere, I look at the history. I love to find the stories of um, the old timey baseball players um, who who came out of these little towns and things like that. But every everywhere around here is so rich and you can just keep digging and just keep digging. It's 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 phenomenal. So let's let me hop into this chat. And uh, now that I'm in the chat, I can't see you, but I'm going to read some questions. All right, Beth North says, I love the Richard Carlisle story, partly because I moved this area from Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and partly because our region, I serve on the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee for South Bend, Elkhart, is so entrepreneurial, and I've been to Japan 17 times for business and eaten green tea flavored ice cream. So I'm thankful another person who made that happen, sort of a parallel path, non-blood relative. I love that so much, and you can definitely thank Richard Carlisle for any Japan ice cream um, I do know in the book, you know, um, it's still a real big issue now, and it obviously was a very, very big issue um, when I did this bike ride a few years ago. There's signs everywhere in New Carlisle um, that are either pro-IEC or anti-IEC, the Indiana Economic Corridor, trying to bring progress there. And one of the things I know in the book is 
that Richard Carlyle would have certainly been in favor of it um, because he was a serial entrepreneur. Um, but for as silly and goofy of a circus guy as he is, like he didn't leave much of that um, behind. All right, Beth also asks, have you and Gabrielle Robinson ever collaborated? Um, we have never collaborated on any writing projects, but um, she is a dear friend of mine. Um, and we do a lot of book fairs together, um, spend a lot of time together. I have, I think I probably have every single one of her books. Mm -hmm. um, Gabrielle was the first person who made me feel like I was a legitimate author. I mean, I had, I had self-published a book and sold several hundred copies, but she, she bought one, she read it, she reached out to me and um, invited me over to her awesome house for tea and we talked books and I was like, wow, I'm a real author. So if you know Gabrielle, um, she's right. amazing. You haven't read her books, you should. And um, maybe we will collaborate in the future. Yeah. Uh, uh, Linda asks, the marsh has been drained, but can one still buy huckleberries in this area? I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I'm, I'm sure someone's still farming huckleberries somewhere. Um, huckleberries are also not, they don't have the cachet they used to have. Um, that's kind of the weird thing when I was first reading that chapter about huckleberries, because I was like, who eats huckleberries? But Apparently, back in the day, the huckleberry reigned supreme ahead of the blackberry and the raspberry. Um, Cynthia says, great stories. Do you do readings at schools or on the radio? Um, I have, I've done something on uh, WVPE before, and um, there's actually um, a documentary coming out on WNIT next month about about the history of Playland Park um, that I collaborated with them on. Um, so you can watch for that. I think it comes out August 28th. Um, and it's all about the amazing history of Playland Park, which is what the first chapter of my new book is about. I have not done readings at schools, um, but I've done lots of library programs and uh, a few other places too. Um, Judy, okay, what's the name author of that first book you mentioned, The Bonus Sinew of the Land? Um, I do not remember the name of the author. Oh, I do. Okay. I looked it up. Now I got to go find. Oh, yeah. No, I got to find it again. Okay. Um, yeah, the book is called The Bone and the Sinew of the Land. Mm -hmm. Gosh, it's it's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable book. So what happened was um, this was pre Civil War. The United States was really trying to push its Western frontier, and one of the ways that they pushed the Western frontier was they offered African Americans land rights and opportunities that they didn't have at home. Um, so we're talking some some freed slaves some Northern freed blacks um, who, you know, were still victims of racial policy, even if they weren't enslaved. But they said, you know, if you settle in any of these areas out West, uh, you can buy land at a fair price, um, you won't be restricted. And so it was hard work, but it was, um, it was something that many, many families chose to do because it was an opportunity. Um, so they came out, they went through the hard work, they established some phenomenal communities. Um, there's a whole chapter in the new book about Cass County, Michigan, which at one point, um, and this is completely true, at one point Cass County, Michigan was the most racially progressive place um, in America, which as someone who has ridden my bike down every single country road in Cass County and seen uh, more than a few Confederate flags, um, it was shocking to me to learn that Cass County was that progressive. That's all in the Bone and Sinew of the Land book. And mm -hmm. I just thought it was fascinating. And then the, the real sad thing is that after those families became established out here, um, then the, um, then progress moved this way and then they were pushed out again. Um, so it's a 
fascinating story of courage, but also a sad story at the end. Uh, did you find that author's name? I did. It's called The Bone and Sinew of the Land, America's Forgotten Black Pioneers and the Struggle for Equality. Anna hyphen Lisa Cox, C-O-X. Yeah, absolutely recommend that, that book. All right, let's see. Uh, Gabrielle is teaching a class at Forever Learners Fall about the process of writing better homes and helping to bring it to the stage. Yes, that I am so excited. Um, if you uh, know Gabrielle, if you've read Better Homes, um, mm -hmm. that's a fascinating story. Um, it was one of my, it, it's probably like one of my three or four favorite South Bend stories. And um, I mentioned it in my first book. Um, but mostly instead of talking about it more, I just tell people to read Gabrielle's book and they are turning it into a play that comes out, I think in November. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm, and I, I hope everyone goes out and supports it. At the Civic Theater, South Penn Civic Theater. Yeah. Cause it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Um, the August Green Drinks event on August 15th, 5.37, we'll meet at the Lydic Bog Nature Preserve. That sounds very cool. A can I go to it? I'll take that as a yes. Um, Lydic Bog is one of my favorite places. Um, absolutely one of my favorite places. So you should go to that event. Um, oh, okay, now I'm reading the next comment. Steve Sass is gonna talk about the history of the Lydic Bog. Yes, go to this. Um, the Lydic bog is fascinating. A bog is, I mean, I, I'm not great with the ecology of everything, and, and I'm sure Steve will tell him more about the history there, but a bog is different than a marsh, and a bog is a really, really unique thing, and um, the bog was discovered by a Notre Dame professor like 100 years ago and then forgotten about, and it's right off of a highway. Um, it's like right there, but then it was rediscovered 20 or 30 years ago, and then they turned it into the park, which is a cool story of how it was found, forgotten, and found again. But I won't step anymore on Steve's toes there. Anne says, it's lucky to hear you talk about the book. Soon after moving here about a year ago, I read the book, and that started my interest in researching our surrounded area. I want to reread it now. Thank you. It was a great induction. So glad the story continues in your second book. I'm glad, too. So thank you for saying that. Um, it's been so much fun to to meet people and be exposed to, to different stories and, and different histories. Um, any other questions, comments, concerns? Do you like my shirt? It's new. I wanted to let everybody know that Better Homes is going to be performing at the Civic between November 10th and uh, November 7th, 18th. So if you're looking to get tickets for any um, particular night, um, you would be well advised to do that, do that sooner rather than later. It will sell out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, someone just asked that I do my bike rides alone. Um, I did some of them alone. I did um, some of them with groups of friends and I did some of them with, uh, with a girl that I was interested in. And uh, I don't want to spoil the ending of that book too much, but uh, it worked out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, since since um, since the events of my first book ended, I have gotten married, I've moved, um, started a new job, uh, published a second book, um, and, and now I'm getting ready to start another new job um, with the Community Foundation of St. Joseph County in just a couple of weeks. So, you, um, you know, Rose at all, she's phenomenal and I'm excited to be there. And um, Barb, I'll miss, I'm gonna miss Neil so much. We've talked about that quite a bit, but uh, I'm excited. It's been, it's been a whirlwind of a couple of years, but it's been a lot of fun. And uh, especially thanks to people like you who are interested in, hearing me read things that I wrote down. I appreciate it. You know, Aaron, we, if there are any more questions, we could have one more story if you have one more story or just an idea of a story. 
Um, sure. I, I'm going to, I'll tell you a story and um, maybe I'll even solicit some help from you because you guys might know things. You might know people and you might be able to help me in what has become my never ending eternal quest. So the first chapter of the new book is about the history of Playland Park. Playland Park is a phenomenal, fascinating place, not just because it had a giant roller coaster in South Bend, which people geek out when they find out that we had a gigantic roller coaster. Um, but it had so much more than that, too. Um, it had a racetrack that once upon a time it hosted the only NASCAR race in the history of South Bend, Indiana. It had the baseball field where the um, South Bend Blue Sox played and won championships. The South Bend Blue Sox employed my favorite baseball player of all time, Jean Fout. Um, she was a pitcher for the team and threw two perfect games. And if you're a baseball fan, um, what you might not know is that no male pitcher in um, professional Major League Baseball or in professional Japanese league baseball um, has ever thrown two perfect games in her career. She's the only athlete in any ah. level, any high level of baseball to throw two perfect games in a career. Barbara um, would have loved that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, somehow she's not the most fascinating baseball story that comes out of Playland Park. And this is, this is where I'm looking for some help. So 1920, the Major League Baseball season ends when Babe Ruth is thrown out trying to steal second base to lose the World Series, okay? Three days later, he gathers up some friends to start touring the nation playing baseball games against local teams. And by the end of October, he's here in South Bend on a field at Playland Park where there is now a closed Walgreens store that I think has been turned into a South Bend Clinic blood testing facility or something. Anyway, so he's playing baseball there and um, he comes up in the sixth or seventh inning. It's getting dark. The umpire wants to call the game, but you can't call the game when Babe Ruth is about to hit again. So they let Babe Ruth bat one more time and he hits a home run that the South Bend Tribune tracks down the ball 605 feet away, which is a massively long home run. Obviously, it bounced and rolled. And if you know the area, there's a little down, sloping downhill. So it's, it's possible that it could have gone that far on a roll. So the babe rounds the bases to a, an applause. They cancel the game. Game's over on account of darkness. And then Babe Ruth, the Sultan of Swat, the Bambino picks up his bat, a bat that he had used during the 1926 World Series. Oh, quick question. Where was Playland Park? Great question. Um, Playland Park was at the corner of Lincoln Way and Ironwood. Um, so if you know the area, the IUSB student apartments down there are where the racetrack was and the old concrete grandstand is still there. Um, the baseball field, the original baseball field was right at the corner of Lincoln Way and Ironwood where that close Walgreens is. The baseball field that the Blue Sox played on was in front of the grandstand and the um, roller coaster was roughly where the Arby's is. Wow. Uh, yeah, so if you walk around there. Anyway, so Babe Ruth circles the bases. Everyone's going nuts. He picks up his bat that he had used during the 1926 World Series and hands it to a young man in the stands named Tom Hoban. Now, to my quest. My quest, I'm telling you, I have spent weeks of my life trying to find this bat. I have spoken with every single one of Tom Hoban's relatives. Um, they are all aware that there was a bat. They don't know what happened to the bat. Um, I mean, if someone threw this bat away, that would it would destroy me. Um, I even went to their old family home 
and knocked on the door and like uh, talked with them for a while. And they've got some old stuff. And they have several old bats from um, the Blue Sox players, but not the Babe Ruth bat. If you um, follow baseball, or even if you don't, I'll just tell you, Babe Ruth famously used the heaviest bat in the history of Major League Baseball. Um, It's an enormously heavy baseball bat. So um, it's not like, so if you had a room with 100 bats, you would be able to tell which one the Babe Ruth bat was. And obviously you'd be able to tell that the old Blue Sox bats were not the Babe Ruth bat, right? Because they're not anywhere near that heavy. Um, So so Aaron, yeah, I'm going to give you your first um, suggestion. Yes, please. Do you know Andrew Berlin well? Yeah, well, I know him enough. Do you know him? well enough to know that he is an absolute nut for the game of baseball. Well, yeah, yeah. If you need any funding. Okay. To put any kind of um, campaign together to find that bat. I know Andrew Berlin would fund you. Okay. All right. So now I have an ally with memes. (laughs) All right. No, I think that's a phenomenal idea. I'm probably going to, I know Joe Hart at, at the at the South Bend Cubs a little better. So I'm going to reach out to him and, uh, and see if he wants to join me in my quest. Also, if you want to come to Rotary with me as my guest, um, I don't know if you know Mark Haley. Mark Haley is a, a member of the club's organization and runs the performance um, center there. So... You're welcome yeah. to come as my guest. Just reach out. All right. That'd be great. Yeah. Shoot me a message. It's just my name, Aaron Hellman at gmail.com. But um, the, I'll tell you that um, this, this new book. So obviously the first chapter is about Playland Park and it talks a lot about this Babe Ruth home run. Um, there's another chapter later that talks about the second time Babe Ruth came to South Bend. He did not hit another home run here, but he did play a really good round of golf at the South Bend Country Club. And my friend, um, Andy Nickel, uh, owns the, the scorecard. And, you know, so there's a picture of that in there. Um, this book, I originally wanted it to come out in the spring. And the reason it didn't come out in the spring was I kept telling myself, you're going to find this bat. And uh, I really wanted to include that in the book. So spoiler alert. This, this new book does not end with me fighting the bat. Um, <laughs> but when I put it together, like my thought was, all right, we're going to mention the bat up front. We're going to mention Babe Ruth in the middle. And then the last chapter is going to be, I find this bat. And it did not happen. But I haven't okay. given. Are there any other questions? No questions, Aaron. Wow, I must have answered everything. (laughs) I guess so. I want to thank you very much for sharing your uh, your adventures with us. Um, And uh, it was very interesting. And we good luck with the book. Um, And uh, we'll wait to hear more stories someday of uh, of of our Michiana. Phyllis would like to say something. I I have a comment, not a question. I grew up in near Canton, Ohio, and there's a a small town near there called Hartville. It had this huckleberry marshes too, which I uh, picked huckleberries in when I was a child. And it's a terrible thing because the mosquitoes are so bad in the marsh. Mm-hmm. Anyway, there they drained it, and their celery fields were there too. Now the wow. celery fields are gone, but they drained the swamp and you know, planted celery. <laughs> that seems crazy that both places would get rid of the huckleberries and plant celery. I know. I don't know why that happened, but that, that wow, yeah, <laughs> that's weird. I have okay. a question. I have a 
verification question for you, Aaron. Yeah. Um, you said your email address is Aaron Hellman at gmail.com. Yep. Okay, perfect. I'll be in touch. Thank you. And thank thanks you. as always to Pam and her committee for putting these together. Sure. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's great fun. And Aaron, thank you for being here today. Yeah, I'm sure I'll see some of it's, you around. Time. Thanks it's for having been me. a delightful way to end the week. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. See you all next month. Next month, next month we will be having, I believe, the president of IUSB will be our speaker. So join us um, on the second Friday of next month. And all of you have a good day. Thanks to all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.